Send in the Highlanders to Snow Great Mischief if they fall. From No Great Mischief by Alistair MacLeod. I see far, far away. I see far over the tide. I see Cape Breton, my love. Far away over the sea. There's a longing in my heart now to be where I was, though I know that it's quite sure I shall never return. The Callum Ruid was my great, great, great grandfather. He came from Scotland's Moidat to the New World in 1779. Sometimes it seems as though we know a lot about him, and at other times very little. There are some facts, and perhaps some fantasies, that change with our own perceptions and interests. These seem to be the facts. He was married in Moidat to Anne Macpherson, and they had six children, three boys and three girls. While these children were still quite small, Anne Macpherson became ill and died of the fever, leaving him with what my grandparents referred to as his care, meaning his motherless children. Later, his wife's younger sister, Catherine Macpherson, came to keep house for him and to look after her nieces and nephews and eventually to marry the man who was their father. They had six more children, again three boys and three girls. Anyone who knows the history of Scotland, particularly that of the Highlands and the Western Isles, in the period around 1779, is not hard-pressed to understand the reasons for their leaving. They already had friends and relatives in North America. Many of them were in the Cape Fear River area of North Carolina. Nearly all of them men, fighting at the time in the American War of Independence. Some of the older ones were on the side of the revolutionaries because they had decided to fight for a new life in the new world. And others fought on the British side because they remained stubbornly loyal to the British cause. At night they sang Gaelic songs to one another across the mountain meadows where they would fight the following day. Singing Gaelic to their highland friends and relatives across the glens of North Carolina. Come on over and join us. You're on the wrong side. Don't be fools. The future is with us. Callum Ruid was 55 in 1779 and had been 21 at the time of the 45 when the call had gone out to rise and follow Charlie. Again there were friends and relatives singing and saying to one another, Don't be fools. You're on the wrong side. Your loyalty is misplaced. Think about it. Pressures from above as well as from all sides. He and his wife and family had apparently talked about leaving for some time and had made their plans quietly and contacted the immigration agent and agreed to meet him and his ship in one of the sheltered coves along the coastline where he was picking up families such as theirs. Bound for Nova Scotia, the land of the trees, although Callum Ruud's destination was Cape Breton, where he had been told in a Gaelic letter there would be land for him if he would come. They were to leave on the 1st of August and the crossing would be perhaps six weeks with favourable winds. 
But in the weeks prior to the departure, the former Catherine McPherson became ill, and they did not know what to do. In the end, they decided to go, having sold their cattle and given up the precious end timbers to their house, which in that land and in that time were hard to come by. Ironically, leaving a land with too few trees for one that was to have, perhaps, too many. They came down to the shore and waited. Callum Rood and his ill but hopeful wife and his twelve children. His eldest daughter was already married to a man named Angus Kennedy from the Isle of Canna, and they waited also. One sees them in imagination's mist, shuffling their feet and watching the horizon, while the shapes of friends and relatives move in and out of the shadows. Perhaps you're making a mistake. You could be fools. The future is uncertain. They waited there, Kalamrud holding his violin and perhaps resting his foot on the wooden sea chest with its neatly divided compartments. All of them with some small provisions and with their money secreted inside their shoes. He was unaware that the French Revolution was coming and that a boy named Napoleon was but ten and had not yet set out to conquer the world. He was not surprised later at the number of his own relatives who died before and during Waterloo, still shouting Gaelic war cries while fighting for the British against the resistant French. General James Wolfe, whom he perhaps did not remember from the 45, was already dead some 20 years, dying with the Highlanders on the plains of Abraham the same Highlanders he had tried to exterminate some 14 years before. It is unlikely that Callum Rood had many thoughts of Wolfe in that August of 1779. His mind was likely filled with more immediate concerns as he prepared to leave the Moidat. Another MacDonald leaving Moidat yet again, although this time not to rise and follow Charlie, although that image and that music may have haunted the recesses of his mind. As they waited on the shore, the dog, who had worked with them for years and been left to the care of neighbours, ran about in a frenzy, sensing that something was wrong, rolling in the sand and whining in her agitation. And when they began to wade out to the smaller boat, which would take them to the waiting ship, she swam in spite of shouted Gaelic threats and exhortations telling her to go back. She swam farther and farther from the land until Callum Rood, unable to stand it any longer, changed his shouts from threats to calls of encouragement and reaching over the side, lifted her soaked and chilled and trembling body into the boat. As she wriggled wetly against his chest and licked his face excitedly, he said to her in Gaelic, Little dog, you have been with us all these years, and we will not forsake you now. You shall come with us. That always got me somehow, I remember my grandfather saying, that part about the dog. The voyage was a bad one. The quarters below were cramped and overcrowded and were apparently modelled partially on those of the transport ships used to carry Highland soldiers to fight in the New World and partially on the quarters of slave ships flying from Africa to ports of that same new world. Overcrowding 
was a matter of simple economic greed. In fair weather, the people could come above decks and move and clean themselves. But in this year of stormy August crossing, they were unable to do so and were forced to remain below in their own stench and confinement. Three weeks out, the former Catherine Macpherson died, her death brought on again by the fever, and no doubt hastened by the overcrowding, the wormy oatmeal, and the tiny measures of brackish water. She was sewn in a canvas bag and thrown overboard, never to see the new world on which she had based such hopes. One week after her death, the wife of Angus Kennedy gave birth. The child was called Catherine and was known ever afterwards as Catriona Namara, Catherine of the Sea, because of the circumstances of her birth. As I have said, these seem to be the facts, or some of them anyway, although the fantasies are my own. And as in the case with the Gaelic songs, I do not choose nor will myself to remember them. They are just there from what, even in my relatively short life, seems like a long time ago. I remember my grandfather telling me the story one afternoon in early spring, as we were out at the woodpile making kindlings, he chopping them and I carrying them in to dry. I was perhaps eleven, and the geese were winging northward, flying over the still iced rivers and lakes, seemingly fools for being so early, yet being geometrically true to their intended course and purpose. After they landed on the shores of Pictou, my grandfather said, Calamrud broke down and wept, and he cried for two whole days, and I guess they were all around him, including the dog, and no one knew what to do. Cried, I said incredulously, because even by then I was conditioned by movies in which people broke into applause when they saw the Statue of Liberty, which their ship was approaching. And they seemed to hug and dance and be happy at landing in the new world. And also the idea of a 55-year-old man crying was a bit more than I was ready for. Cried, I said. What in the world would he cry for? I remember the way my grandfather drove the axe into the chopping block with such violent force that it became deeply embedded and he had difficulty getting it out later and looked at me with such temporary anger in his eyes that, he, that I thought he would snatch me by my jacket front and shake me. His eyes said that he couldn't believe I was so stupid but they said so only for a moment. He was, he said, composing himself, and after a thoughtful moment, crying for history. He had left his country and lost his wife and spoke a foreign language. He had left as a husband and arrived as a widower and a grandfather, and he was responsible for all those people clustered around him. He was, he said, looking up to the sky, like the goose who points the V, and he temporarily wavered and lost his courage. Anyway, he went on. They waited there for two weeks, trying to get a shallop to take them across the water and here to Cape Breton. And then, I guess, he got better and set his teeth, as they say, and resolved to carry on. It's a good thing for us that he did. As I gathered the kindling that fell from his axe, another V of geese flew north, 
these seemed somehow lower, and it was almost as if one could hear the strong and regulated whoosh of their grasping, powerful, outstretched wings. He continued to live for many years, Kalamurud, giving his life a strange sort of balanced structure. He lived to be 110 years old, 55 years in Scotland and another 55 years in the land across the sea. Fua Dotanam Peace to his soul.